The 1980s were a controversial time for kids' cartoons, and they didn't get much more controversial than Rambo, The Force of Freedom. By the middle of the decade, John Rambo had become a cultural icon and the quintessential action hero. And so turning him into a cartoon character may have seemed like a no-brainer at first, but anyone who had seen any of the first two Rambo movies would have been aware of the endless challenges of turning an R-rated film series into a cartoon show. Yet despite the initial hesitancy and full-blown outrage at the idea, Rambo The Force of Freedom still got the green light, and the result was not only a rating success, but also an interesting footnote in the history of Saturday morning cartoons. Join us now as we look back at the development and the legacy of what has become arguably the most conscientious cartoon to ever have met the FCC's decency standards. By the mid-1980s, children's television had become more popular than ever, with millions of children worldwide waking up early to watch Saturday morning cartoons, many of which were based on popular children's toys at the time. However, with its growing popularity came increased attention and concern from watchful parents groups such as Action for Children's Television, who had started to accuse many of these shows as being little more than 20 minute long, glorified toy commercials. These groups also set their eyes on other cartoons based on popular films at the time, which brought with them objections to the level of violence these shows seemed to glorify in the eyes of young children. Against this backdrop of higher standards and sustained criticism, the studio execs over at Ruby Spears Enterprises were undaunted as they attempted the seemingly impossible, producing the first animated series to be adapted from an R-rated film series, namely Rambo. Notwithstanding the vocal condemnation from parents, groups and TV critics alike, the idea also generated mild controversy in the production studio, as writers wondered how they could present a child-friendly main character who was initially created as a troubled Vietnam War veteran suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder (PTSD). A long-standing internet rumor has it that the writing team consulted child psychologists who advised them, among other things, to make no mention of Vietnam or prisoners of war. This rumor was debunked by head writer, story editor Michael Chain in an interview he did with Matthew Chernoff at toplessrobot.com. In the interview, Chain says that he and his writing team instead relied on their past experience writing for children's television, as well as common sense, to know what would be suitable for a young audience. The other challenge the writers faced was to tone down the notorious violence depicted in the films without turning Rambo into a peace-loving pacifist and stripping away everything that made the action hero so appealing to young children everywhere, even the ones who had never seen the movies. In fact, a recurring theme throughout the cartoon was Rambo's reluctance to use violence unless as a last resort, instead priding himself of his ability to outsmart his opponents, much like MacGyver later. As a result, Rambo never shot or killed anyone in Rambo The Force of Freedom. The cartoon compensated by emphasizing action over violence, and while the weapons in the show were never used to deadly effect, they were surprisingly authentic and detailed. Rambo The Force of Freedom was pitched as a two-minute trailer, and the series was greenlit three months later, with a five-part miniseries acting as the pilot to the show, which ran five days a week. The pilot debuted on April 14, 1986, and was renewed in September as a daily cartoon. The episodes were a huge success, and the ratings were through the roof, pulling primetime numbers for a Saturday morning cartoon. The pace of the show was intense, and each episode felt like a condensed 22-minute action movie, featuring stunts and effects that the movies could only dream of. In fact, a few scenes from the pilot episodes were recreated in Rambo 3, including the helicopter and tank scenes. Rambo appeared daily until December that same year, when it was decided that the series would not be renewed for a second season due to increased pressure from various parent watch groups, including activist Peggy Charon and her Action for Children's television group. In the same interview with Topless Robot, Chain points out that Rambo was less violent compared to shows like G.I. Joe, 
and goes on to speculate that the main reason for the controversy surrounding Rambo The Force of Freedom was simply due to the title, as well as the ratings the show enjoyed. The pilot miniseries managed to retain the realistic tone without the notorious violence of the films, and also helped establish the style of the entire 65 episode series. The pace of each episode is intense, filled with relentless action scenes, all dotted with realistic depictions of authentic weaponry. Here, Michael Chain made use of his military background and incorporated accurate designs of real-life weapons, except in the cases where the writers were told to introduce a specific toy that came in the inevitable toy line. The introductions of characters based on the toy line also moved the show towards the end of its run from a faithful adaptation of the film series to a crazier, almost science fiction-like feel, featuring freaky characters like the villains Dr. Hyde and X-Ray. The series also took another turn and, introducing the characters of White and Black Dragon, ventured into the world of martial arts. A few on the writing team had a background in martial arts and felt it appropriate to introduce this into the show, as Rambo often acted alone, much like a Ronin. The episode Enter the Black Dragon at times played out like a genuine martial arts movie, which the animators in Japan particularly enjoyed working on, even going so far as to write to the team in America congratulating them on the authenticity of the script. Plots and storylines often echoed real-life historical and cultural events at the time, but apart from the tone and visual style, the series made sure to be completely independent from the original Rambo novel and film series, apart from a couple of recreated scenes from the films, with no mention of Vietnam, the war, or Rambo's resultant PTSD. An element that did make it into the cartoon show was Jerry Goldsmith's original themes from the film series. Jerry Goldsmith's scores for First Blood and Rambo First Blood Part 2 were licensed for use in the series, with his music for the film's trailer for Rambo First Blood Part 2 used as the opening and closing themes. It was supplemented by original music composed by Hayim Saban and Shuki Levy, who received an additional music by credit. The success of Rambo The Force of Freedom took everyone by surprise, producers and critics alike, and spawned not one but two toy lines, one released in 1986 and the other in 1987, long after the cartoon was off the air. Even though the show broke the mold and set a new precedent for children's shows to come, and despite its immense popularity and non-violent content, Rambo still wasn't free from controversy as concerned parent groups such as the ones who attended the notorious He-Man workshop at New York's Christchurch Day School nevertheless decided that cartoons had become too violent and Rambo was to be made an example of. Rambo ran for 65 episodes in its first season from September until December 1986 and was not renewed for a second season. Well, there it is guys, the strange story of the first cartoon to have been adapted from an R-rated film. Ironically, a lot of the criticism the show generated came from those who had never actually watched it, and it was popular with kids who had never seen the films. At the end of the day, Rambo The Force of Freedom achieved what it set out to do. Firstly, sell toys, but importantly, give kids their own rendition of the biggest action star on the planet. Let us know in the comments below if you enjoyed watching this show as a kid or if you thought the criticism was fair. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already and remember to stay tuned for more cartoon history.